Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me on another episode of Formcast. My name is Eric Alina, and today I'm joined again by my friend Sam Livingston, uh, who runs Car Design Research, and you can find out more about him on a previous podcast that we recorded. Now, we are going to talk about the cars that were unveiled this month of April 2021, and we've just come off of the back of the Shanghai Motor Show, which unfortunately none of us could attend. But there are quite a lot of new cars um, that have been unveiled since we last did this podcast, Sam. So um, where do you want to start? Shall we kick it off alphabetically? It's it's hard to know, isn't it? There is quite a lot of new stuff. Um, And as you said, Shanghai is happening this week as we record this conversation. So you and I have just been talking about quite a few different things that are out there. And I guess also things which we're not necessarily going to touch on now we'll cover off in in a conversation in a week or two. Um, yes. But yeah, I, th- I think that what might make sense is to sort of, if you like, have less of a Chinese focus on this conversation, talk about some of the stuff that's come from more of the Western brands. Um, I know that that Audi is something which everybody's really interested in. I, I mean, the A6 or the A6 yep. e-tron concept. Um, and that's a yeah, really interesting car. Um, I think design is uh, it, it's an interesting thing from a design perspective for being this elegant product, uh, for being something that we're seeing that comes um, after, if you like, the sort of Porsche-based um, uh, e-tron thing that we saw um but i suppose what's significant about it is it's actually going hey look this is what a, a, a mainstream electric audi should be um instead of sort of you know by positioning it as an a6 that's the name it's been given despite being a fastback like an a7 um it very much seems to be Audi saying hey look this is new heartland this is not like a sub brand so much e-tron this is this is center stage um and to see that they've managed to carry off what looked to be very elegant proportions while still having you know a big range and a modern electric powertrain um yeah it looks really impressive i think Um, i I agree yeah most definitely i mean you know proportionally they've shifted things around a bit right um because it has a much longer wheelbase therefore shorter overhangs as well so it's going to be a more spacious interior um what i love about it is you know now he's always been great at this game is the technology game right i mean if we avoid such gimmicks like you know playing a video game through the headlamps um, the headlamps themselves and how slim they are is really something that I like and that I think obviously through advancements of technology they've been able to achieve and something that I would have expected much sooner. Um, you know, in the, the tail lamp, of course, you know, the single um, continuous band around the rear is something that we've seen time and time and time again. But it's a very different approach in that Audi's is um, more 3D. Um, it's, it's not flush at all with the body. It's, um, in fact... Uh, a bit of an aerodynamic element into the rear. So yeah, traditional sedan, yes. Um, but I think they've done it, uh, you know, in, in a very nice way. We haven't seen the interior yet, of course, but there, uh, there is one element um, on the body side and they do this across all e-trons is this, uh, this, this black element above the, uh, the rocker. And, you know, it, it just, I wish that it extended into the front wheel well, and I just did a little mock-up uh, picture that I posted on Twitter. But um, it, it's something that they've done through all of their e-tron vehicles. It's kind of a brand signifier, and and that I don't know. I, I think you know from a surfacing perspective, it could have been a bit better. Yeah, I mean, no, as a device, obviously, that visually slims the depth of the body side. Um, you yes, could argue that you need to, but I mean, you know, it does make that car what it is in many respects. Um, fairly conventional proportions. And actually, what I also think is interesting is the way that design actually extends from the Audi A5 Sportback from what 15 years ago. That's right. um, and fascinating. I remember talking to Akin Badstumer, who was the head of exterior design at Audi at the time, and he was describing how actually to make that design happen, they really had to push from a design side. Say, look, it's not just a hatchback as it used to be known. This is a fastback. And of course, Audi pioneered with that product and set this sort of genre. And in many ways, other brands are following. And now we're seeing them um, sort of redouble their efforts with this product because actually it's got like, you call it sedan, I'd call it a fastback. It's got this really fast back. It's got quite an elegant design. It is quite sporty. Uh, it's not your conventional three box. Um, so actually, I think they're using their legacy there quite well. Um, and I'm yeah, quite intrigued to see how this, intrigued to see the interior and, to, and also intrigued to see how the final production design uh, will be when it comes through. Yes, I don't think it'll change much. But I think the first sport back was actually the A7, and that was the one that broke the mold under De Silva. Sure. Um, and this car is actually much closer in size to that than it is uh, the A6 kind of sits in the middle. Um, so anyway, all right, well, moving on to another European product that also had an unveiling in Shanghai, had its online unveiling beforehand, and that is the Citroen C5X. 
Um, this is, you know, we talk about typology blurring vehicles all the time. It just seems like that's kind of what's happening in this huge crossover amongst different well-defined vehicle typologies. Um, and I guess that's a way to create something new, but Citroen C5X, um, what are your thoughts on that car? Well, I mean, in a way, very sadly, it debuted the same week that, uh, the famous car designer Robert Opram died. And of course he was responsible for the, the SM indeed. I think he did the DS facelift. Um, if that's what it's called, uh, he did the CX and the GS. So the whole sort of, um, lineage and that, that powerful statement of what a large Citroen was in the back half of the 20th century, um, was maybe not owned by him, but he was very much central to that. And, and the idiom of that, which then carried through to an extent in the XM, to an extent in the C C6, this very svelte, um, quite reserved, quite, um, should we say undynamic, but actually very, uh, calm aesthetic, very sort of future orientated, very, uh, lightweight and aerodynamic looking that sort of identity that, that he very much put as a stake in the ground for Citroen. It's interesting to see how this, this C5X actually does flip that. Um, and of course we've got the DS brand now, which perhaps owns the sort of formality, um, and it maybe owns a sort of elegant aesthetic that once upon a time might be Citroen. So to some degree, Citroen therefore need to or have felt the need to occupy a different space. And, and of course, it's quite distinct from that of the large Citroens we've seen uh, from before. Um, on a personal level, I'm a, I, I love those that Citroen aesthetic that they used to be. Um, so I warm to this one less for that reason. But wearing my sort of professional hat, I think as you, you were describing, that sort of genre blur um, that this car sits in, the way in which it sort of has this sort of slightly SUV toughness to it, probably makes some sense. Um, yeah. But actually, I think the big story for this, for me anyway, in design terms, is the, some of the color material design. You know, you look up close at some things that they've done in the interior of that car, the, the finessing of the details and, and the textures. You've got these lots of interesting technical um, relief uh, that you've got inside that car. And I think it really is quite impressive. So, yeah, mm. interesting design, Eric. I, I do like the interior. I think PSA is doing very well in terms of, you know, what, what they're putting together in the interior. Um, you know, Peugeot, Citroën, and they're, they're doing very well. Um, the exterior of the, of the car, I mean, I definitely agree with you in terms of, you know, where it is that it's coming from. Uh, of course, Robert, you know, Robert Oprone was a great figure in the Citroën brand, pioneering some really innovative con uh, vehicle um, uh, products basically that were coming out of, of, uh, of that studio at the time. And I think that they, you know, given electrification, given aerodynamics, cause that's a huge factor right now in vehicle design, um, they could have played a bit more on that aesthetic on that, um, that look that they, you know, was very much seen on the, on the CX and a number of other products that you mentioned as well. And so to see this kind of morph into, um, I want to call it like an Audi all road. It's almost like, you know, uh, an a six all road, even though it's not a wagon and it's a, it's a, it got a faster backlight, but it, nonetheless, it's kind of this genre of vehicle that again is a, you know, crossover blurring certain elements of being adventurous and as well being stately and, um, and elegant because it is in fact a big Citroen. But, um, one thing that I do question is, you know, um, sales figures or something like this, right? I mean, how important is this going to be for the brand? I think it's going to be a little kind of notch where they're going to sell a couple, you know, a couple thousand a year type thing. I mean, honestly, um, I don't see this as being a volume seller for uh, Citroen, um, unfortunately, um, even though, you know, it's, it's a decent vehicle. Um, you know, there's nothing particularly wrong with it from my perspective. I like how it captured a lot of the essence of the concept that was shown previously, um, you know, the CX experience, I believe it was called, um, that was shown at some motor show at one point. Um, and, uh, and, and then they kind of, you know, turned it into a production car. So anyway, that's my take on it. Um, so moving on, moving on, I think to the Ford Evos, which was also unveiled in Shanghai. Um, this is a vehicle that is not intended for sale outside of China. And to me, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a very Chinese market centric vehicle developed by Ford. Um, you know, the fact that it bears the Evos name is kind of a bit of a slap in the face to that beautiful concept that was unveiled in 2011 under Jay Mays. Um, but to me, it's, it's not, 
um, it, it's 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 not necessary, right? I mean, let's 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 be frank, okay? Um, you've got the um, the the Ford Mach E, um, and now we've got the Evos, and the Evos is essentially a Mach E. They're built on the same platform. Um, you know, it's essentially the same car. I mean, I've been looking and, and kind of pouring over pictures. I can't see much of a difference other than the front face and the interior, right? They've got this massive coast to coast screen like Biden did. So what's your take? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I guess it's the yin to the yang, you know, you're, you're like, you can't understand it for those reasons. I'm like, I can understand it for those reasons. If, if I'm, I'm, I'm no, I'm not an expert on, on the Mustang brand and how it's perceived in China. Um, but a wet finger in the air suggests that actually Mustang as a brand um, is is massive in in America, and it's got some penetration in Europe as well. Um, but actually, maybe in, in in China, it doesn't really mean much. And as a consequence, I would imagine that Ford have thought, well, actually, there's no particular reason for us to to introduce this brand in this form for the, with a Mackie. Um, we can actually present this as a sort of heartland Ford products and, and and that makes sense to them and you know we talked in this and the podcast that we did um about a month ago about the relationship between the audi and the porsche top range products um the, the sort of sports sedans that they both got um and how similar they are under the skin arguably that's what ford are doing here and i think there may well be some good reason i, I suspect that china don't really have a mustang much on their radar so this product is more attuned to them. And I, and I think also, whilst we are in a global marketplace and these big brands do have to deliver global products, I think there is a recognition that in many respects, these markets are behaving differently. Um, we're going to talk about the Mercedes in a minute and you know the way in which that's got different interiors, which I'm sure will skew in its sales across different markets. So I think there is a need for the brands and they're, they're doing the right thing to recognize that you can deliver uh, consistent engineering solutions, perhaps in the core structure of the vehicle and the core design architecture, but actually have a distinction in maybe the exterior skin and certainly the interior and the UX and so forth. So yeah. you know, I think it makes sense, Eric, but yes, it's... No, I mean, that was one. that's one point that it definitely, and I'd actually forgotten about that because the Mustang brand is in fact something new that Ford has initiated and it's been out now for a couple of years, maybe a year, a, a bit longer. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not something that I'm not living in the States anymore. It's not something that particularly... Um, impacted me, and I would always see that as a as a Ford product rather than a Mustang product. But I suppose in a market like uh, like China, which is you know generally unaccustomed to um, what a Mustang is, or um, indeed holds more value in the Ford brand, um, you know, and then they can hold it up and say, "Hey, this is a Ford product designed specifically for you guys in China." So I definitely see that point. Um, I you know. It, and and we've seen other uh, a whole lot of other manufacturers, Ford specifically, create vehicles geared towards the Chinese customer that aren't going to be selling elsewhere, um, and that are very unique to the Chinese market. So I guess it makes it makes sense from that perspective, and definitely from the brand recognition perspective, as you mentioned. So let's move on to the next vehicle, and this is a car that uh, I believe you were involved in at some point uh, early on in the uh, process when we saw the Santa Cruz in the Detroit Auto Show in 2015. Um, we saw the Santa Cruz concept debut, um, I, I was always, always really fond of that um, because, you know, obviously in the, in the U.S. market, when I was living and um, spending time, particularly in California. There was a huge, um, you know, enthusiasm for mini trucks, and uh, indeed, when I grew up in the U.S., there was, you know, trucks from Nissan, from Toyota, um, compact pickups that had, you know, what they would call a king cab, you know, a little, a little back, uh, and, and the, that that was a Nissan terminology, a little back area where you had a fold down seat and make it more practical, um, and that was something that was you know, really kind of a white space in the market. I think it's been missing for a long time. And so, um, you know, it's nice to see that Hyundai has come out with something to fill that need for something a bit more compact. Now, again, it's going to be more car-like, mainly because it's on a Yudu body construction, but it is nowhere near what a Honda Ridgeline was. And I think the, the Ridgeline missed the mark for two reasons. One, it was too big. Um, it was not something that was considered, um, you know, uh, a mini truck certainly and the bed was too small as well and so and then it was riding on these little wheels but secondly and more importantly no one really saw honda as making um you know a 
truck. And arguably, you know, Toyota and Nissan were seen in the same way when they first entered the market. And so Hyundai coming now, I think the time is right. The timing is way more like, um, you know, geared towards having something like that be successful, especially off the back of this pandemic, where people want to go out and do more stuff, adventure and all the rest. Um, and to have it developed in California as it was, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of that product. I mean, I'd love to get behind the wheel and see what it actually drives and what it, what it's like. But from a distance, looking at pictures, um, I think they made that translation well from concept to production using now Hyundai's new um, design language and new identity, especially from the truck segment, you know, seeing as they're taking the face off the Tucson and all the rest. So. I'm I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, What's I mean, I'm a, I'm I'm a big fan too, Eric. Um, uh, and I mean, it was, it was 20, 2015 that they showed the Santa Cruz at um, in Detroit, um, and actually, um, Car Design Research was sort of involved with that program. And as much as we did um, a lot of on the show floor evaluation of that concept, and 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 uh, essentially provided a package to try to help substantiate that conceptual direction, because as you know better than most, the whole concept of a truck. Um, in the states is is very distinct, and there's a lot of quite emotive responses to it. And you know, the ridge line didn't succeed, and you won't find many people who are sort of petrol heads, gearheads in the states that don't have a viewpoint that's quite strong about trucks and what it is and what it isn't and what it can't be. And fundamentally, what Hyundai are doing here and what they did with their show car was something a lot of people said was not right. It's not you know it was not getting it. It was not a proper truck, etc. But then again, yeah, as you've also said, it's a white space. You've got trucks. You've got uh, crossovers. I'm trying to get on camera here. You've got trucks, you've got crossovers. This is a space that sits in between and it can work. And Subaru really, you know, they attempted this in a very interesting way, but not necessarily in the most logical way and saying on the most attractive resulting design way, maybe. A Honda, they they succeeded to some degree, of course, um, but they also failed in other respects, probably because essentially they were trying to go head to head with something with a different sort of set of ingredients. This is not trying to do that. This is very much going here as a bit of a space. It makes sense. With my British head on, of course, I don't get trucks at all. It's like, well, look, all the, you'll get rain on your kit. It will get stolen. Why would you put it? Well, I just don't get it. But from the from the US perspective, I imagine this product really ought to do well. I, I'm, I'm very much, you know, I'd I bet the house on it. it. It's got a really distinct position here. And I think it, it sits at that crossroads comfortably. Um, so I've, you know, got every expectation that the design team that executes it and the product people behind making this happen, um, some of whom are no longer at Hyundai. Um, I really think we should take our hats off to them because it's great to see something which is actually fresh conceptually in the US market, which doesn't actually happen so very often if we take out the uh, the, the electrified products of, of recent years. So, no, I think yeah. it's impressive. And actually also just briefly to mention interesting detail in that um, bed, you've got a secure storage in the base of that too. So it's been thought through thoroughly. It's not just a sort of whimsical thing. It's not just a, a new design type. Um, they've they've gone through this product very thoroughly. I think it's a good proposition. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, it, I, I guess it took a little while for um, for everyone to kind of you know put their finger on exactly what it is that they wanted to develop. I had a chance to chat with the design team as well about this truck, and um, I think it will be successful. And I mean, look, they're not the only ones looking at this. I mean, you had Volkswagen with the Tarok. You've got Ford coming out with the Mavericks, which is actually very interesting because. Um, Maverick, uh, Mavericks is a surfing spot in California. Uh, Santa Cruz is known for surfing as well. Um, so the fact that they've named these trucks, um, after popular surf spots, I mean, kind of gives you an idea of what the target demographic is. Um, and you know, there's, there's a number of contenders that are looking to enter into this space. And, um, you know, these types of products do exist elsewhere in the world and are successful. So there's no reason why this type of lifestyle, um, sports adventure vehicle as they're calling it will won't be a success in the u.s market so all right moving on now to the lexus lfz electrified concept and this is something that was unveiled the month prior um we've seen it now debut in shanghai this is something that i actually really like um you know it's it, it, it pushes forward Lexus, and, and Lexus has always been quite brave, you know, Toyota as well, we'll get to that later, but um, quite brave in terms of, you know, their design identity and their design language and what it is that they're choosing to convey. And it's a very robust quality and it's a, you know, very angular as well. So it kind of speaks to a bit of the, the tech and the edginess that they have. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of actually interesting elements on that. Um, you know, of course, everyone now is kind of 
utilizing the graphic of their grill, but enclosing it somehow, um, giving it a kind of a, a different take on uh, on their brand identity, which is interesting. Um, but one of the things that I uh, that I noticed on this, and you know, it's probably just a bit of conf- concept car um, flair, if you will, um, is the uh, the veins that are coming off of the front wheel arch in particular. And these veins are kind of repeated throughout. And I think the veins, much like copper, is something that's going to be very much defining for an electric vehicle um, in terms of an aesthetic quality, in terms of what it conveys, mainly because of its link to electricity. And I think, you know, seeing those, um, those that graphic um, is, is something that t- Toyota has kind of latched onto and has been um, doing for a little while now. Um, and then, you know, of course the blacked out, a, um, the blacked out wheel arch, which we're seeing not only on this product, but on a number of other cars, including the EQS production car that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, I think it's, uh, it's a very cool product again, right now it's in its conceptual phase. Um, but you know, I, there's a lot of things that I, that I enjoy about it. It's a bit busy, you know, if we look at it from a surfacing perspective, like, but, um, you know, it's, it's, sh- it's a show car though, isn't it? I mean, you know, that's yeah. allowed. Isn't it? And actually right, for right. Alexis relatively, it, it's actually calming down. <laughs> I would suggest, I mean, that's down. relatively, yeah, you've got, I think the surface as well as a lot of subtlety in the surface then. And, and it's not that Lexus hasn't had this before, but it, they, they, it does feel like it's got a bit of a softening. It's, it's coming back. Um, there's something else that I feel like I'm seeing more and more in, in, in coming from the sort of Toyota, uh, Lexus space, which is a sort of almost a more three dimensional way that they're looking at the car. It's, it's less side front rear, but whilst it is strong graphically, a lot of the way the surfaces seem to be, you know, very much wrapping around. Um, and they're sort of very much exploring with, with form in a more sort of three dimensional way. Maybe that's a slightly naive response to describe. Um, and there's all sorts of other details. They've got these sort of intersections where bits push through, which is probably going to be hellishly hard to do in production. Um, but there's little sort of surface elements that sort of butt into the next surface, which I think is interesting. So, yeah, a lot on this. But actually, in a way, for me, it's the interior, which is fascinating. I mean, Absolutely. it is a show car. Um, so, yeah, it's, you, you've got to be careful as to how much you might sort of, if you like, want to read into this. Um, but the sort of core architecture you've got this sort of separate colored driver's seat which we have seen before but it's, it's actually quite zoned with other elements as well around the driver and then he's really just sort of distinct sitting um, bucket like seats um, and again quite strong use of color and, and graphics inside and i think it's a fun show car actually um i'm really gutted to not be at auto shows getting to see these it's been a year now of not actually um, properly seeing them we've got people in shanghai but i'm not there you're not there um, you know, I'm really holding out that Munich's going to be an amazing show, fingers crossed. But hmm. yeah, not seeing this in the flesh is a real shame because I think there's a lot there that's quite subtle, actually. Yes. No, I mean, look, the, the colorway on the seat is obviously meant to convey a certain degree of sportiness, right? That's totally what it is that they're going for with this car. But I think it is really well done in how they've separated out the areas. And of course, the lighting bands that flow through this, uh, the cabin as well, speak to the technology. And then the screens, you know, um, it's, it's something similar to, uh, you know, what we've seen, um, before on, uh, on the, um, uh, other Toyota products um, that have basically come up with this very driver-oriented, um, you know, uh, display, and I, I think it, it, it's it's good. It's calming at the same time, though, because clearly there aren't many buttons in it, and um, of course this has a yoke steering wheel as well, which is acceptable in this concept form. Um, but you know, of course, it's uh, it, it's also you know, something that Toyota is actually going to be banking on. And we'll get to that very shortly. So I think moving on into the next car, if we're going in alphabetical order, is the Mercedes EQS. And a very important uh, vehicle for Mercedes under this new EQ brand, um, the first all-electric car to come from um, Stuttgart. And, and, you know, I don't know. um, There's some things... To like, you know, um, when I first saw the the uh, the screen, you know, the hyper screen, and you know, there's certain things that obviously, you know, smacked me in the face quite literally because I didn't understand why you would want something like that. And again, as you pointed out in the last podcast that we recorded, uh, you can opt to have that or not to have that. Um, I think in the interior, you know, it's actually from a luxury technology kind of, you know, communicating that forward-looking futuristic um, 
look um, in that interior, there it, it's they've they've achieved that, you know, without question. Um, now, if you look at the exterior, to me, I like the show car when I saw it, you know, two tone paint and all. But this, to me, I know where you know where it comes from. I understand that they're trying to communicate, um, you know, the aerodynamic efficiency, and certainly this is very aerodynamic. This is a a point two OCD, um, you know, drag coefficient. It's it's extremely slippery, um, which is very necess necessary for electric vehicles. But at the same time, it just kind of uh, there's nothing that speaks high end luxury car to me at all. Um, you know, it's just a little, I mean, you know, I, I want to call it a jelly bean. It's kind of like, it's just it's, this. It's, eh. such a, it's such a challenge, isn't it, though? It's such a challenge because, um, you know, all that you say stands. Uh, but to some degree, this sort of the signifier of this luxury car or whatever, often it's wedded to a sort of traditional idiom of, of something. And, and this clearly is trying not to be that and fundamentally is not that. You know, it's their first all-electric platform at this scale. Um, and it's a, you know, technologically an exceedingly impressive thing. And, and it, it, it sits in parallel, if you like, in the, in the range to the S class as the S diminishes in its stature and its sales and it's significant. This will come up. So it's a really, as you say, super important car for them. But, um, it, I guess fundamentally there's a sort of jury still out on, on how Mercedes in particular as a brand, but I guess all car companies can manage to deliver sort of premium signifier, luxury signifier that statement um and actually as a consequence of course command very high price points um when actually the, the design itself may actually sort of speak of of not being that type of car so i think it's a real challenge um a lot of the heavy lifting they're doing here with color as you say is this color break i mean that's a traditional sort of coach built car signifier back from you know god knows when um and uh, they brought it in in the show car. They've also got a lot of interesting things happening with the graphics and the lighting and so forth. So with the details, with the illumination, and with a, with a sort of bicolor, they are bringing in a level of sort of punch. Um, and maybe they're trying to bring in also um, some level of sort of premium or luxury standing, which would perhaps be less evident otherwise. Um, mm. But, I mean, it's, it's just how would you square the circle with this as a design team? It's, it's incredibly hard, and I think they've done broadly a good job. And, of course, design in the interior is coming up in as much as in terms of the total design deliverable here. Well, maybe the exterior has less of a statement in terms of its form. It has to be aerodynamic. It has to adopt these proportions for different reasons as well. Um, but actually step inside, and other than the fact you've got the hyperscreen, which in its own right is a huge story, you've got an alternative, which I think is interesting. It's the first time we've really seen a brand do something quite so markedly different in terms of going, you can have this or you can have that, two very different orientations of interior. So that that's really interesting. But then also, you know, all facets of the interior, there's a lot there, there's a lot of richness. Um, there's a lot of obviously features and functions, but actually in terms of design content, I think there's so much the design story about this product is, is on the inside. Um, ultimately, how, how it will run in the marketplace in terms of being, you know, the, the wealthy individual's statement of, of having arrived, of, of being successful, and, and how much the exterior actually does the lifting that it needs to do in that, only time will tell. Um, but it's certainly, I think, very hard to see, if you like, how else they might have approached this. And, and I think they've done a, a broadly good job, even if we can always be critical of some facet. I think you, what we've got there is a very impressive product. And, of course, like the Audi that we talked about, this is, in a way, the first time we're seeing this dedicated to all electric. No messing around with ICE powertrains or, or rather package package derived products the, this is dedicated uh, and yet it's not a tall vehicle and it is from a massive brand so it's it's properly significant how this how this one works out in the marketplace will be a really important um teller as to how 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 well ultimately its design is, is functioning yes no i mean look i i agree with you look t the technology is there there's without question um there are certain elements of that vehicle, I think, that are more tinsel than, you know, actual, you know, any anything significant from a design perspective. Um, but, you know, clearly it's great to give uh, customers the option, for example, to have little stars in the grill, um, you know, or in need in the <laughs> frontal area, um, you know, something that they can specify that they can personalize. And I think, you know, that definitely speaks to luxury. Um, of course the coach built, um, you know, two tone thing, as you mentioned, um, I, I hate the way that they split the cutterway, the, the colorway through into the wheel arch, but that's, let's not talk about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I'm not a fan either, 
But Eric, let's face it, they're going to offer something which is not just a bite. There, there's they're a few things. I mean, you know, the wheel choice, for example, I mean, they look like, you know, wagon wheels off of a carriage. You know, the five spoke designs are a hell of a lot better, but yeah, the other ones. Um, so, and finally, I think the biggest issue, I suppose, that I have is I'm conditioned. You're conditioned. We've all seen what luxury products are, right? Quote unquote luxury, what a Bentley is, what a what a Jaguar is, what an S class is, right? And so when you look at those vehicles and you see that proportional shift, I arguably I would say Lucid nailed it. They moved the Y0 back, they somehow made it luxury. And this to me is still like this shape, you know, um, optimized and efficient um though it is certainly um it just it's it's a hard one for me to grasp now perhaps it's a generational thing perhaps i'm too old right um perhaps some young kid in china who's got like a hell of a lot of money is going to see this as a signifier of his wealth as an elevation of his own personal stature to own one of these products from a visual perspective um i don't see that and it could be just me. I mean, look, everybody yeah, has a different. I, mean, um, I think. I think you know. You shouldn't run yourself down. You've got a point of of, of informed expertise here, um, unlike very very many people. Um, so yeah, perhaps you're expressing a personal view, but it's a pretty informed one. Um, and I suggest you're actually maybe quite representative of the type of person that might buy this product, even if you don't have the spare change on you right now. <laughs> um, but actually, yeah, you bring in Lucid. I mean, Lucid is a brand, of course. Uh, they've got this amazing thing, the air, as, as, you, as you've described, and I, I'm a fan also. Um, the design has to do the selling that. The design has to deliver because the Lucid brand kind of doesn't mean anything because it's box fresh. Right. On the other hand, Mercedes, they can just go in and go, hey, we're Mercedes, here it is. Uh, and it's not to say the design doesn't have a role there, but to your point, it is quite conceivable that the, that the design of this Mercedes-Benz EQS may not necessarily have to contribute to making it a success in the way that it does have to contribute to making the Lucid a success. Um, so, um, you know, I think your argument could have some weight to it. Very good point. Very good point indeed, Sam. Um, you know, brand value is incredibly important. Some people just buy it because of that. Um, and that may well be the case here. Now, China. Indeed. So moving forward now, last vehicle that we're going to discuss uh, is the Toyota BZ. 4X. Now, this uh, this is what a, a little compact crossover. I mean, perhaps it's not that little. It's you know maybe a mid-sized thing. Nonetheless, it is the first vehicle that we've seen to, in Toyota to have what you know what we largely derided last time, um, a yoke. And um, you know it's it's not your traditional kind of night rider yoke, um, but nonetheless they've lopped off the steering wheel and indeed because of drive-by-wire technology, as many people have informed me. Um, clearly, there's a lot of things that are you're able to do now with vehicles in terms of you know, the steering wheel and, and, and all of the rest. Um, but to me, that is a decent product. Um, as one to shepherd in the new BZ brand, I don't know. Um, clearly, it's a vehicle that a lot of people are buying, right? The midsize the Missai crossover segment is huge and booming. It is only going to get bigger um, as more people, um, you know, ditch their sedans or wagons and move into this typology. So it's a it's a great one to start off with. Um, now, I think from a market perspective, it will sell well in the states. It will sell well in Europe. I'm not sure if you know it is going to be um, offered in China. I presume it will be. Um, Toyota's got a hell of a lot of catching up to do in China in terms of electric vehicles. Um, you know, they're, they're not really, um, putting things out there. Uh, you know, it's certainly not at the price point that some of these Chinese customers are willing to pay, um, for a Toyota product. So anyway, what are your thoughts on I, this? I warm to this a lot, actually. Um, it, I, just to sort of flag to you, we've talked today, uh, about, um, the Citroen C5X. Uh, we've talked about the, um, for Evos, uh, and we were talking earlier about the Lexus LF7, they've all got this similar thing, which is to say that they are actually exceedingly low crossovers or exceedingly tall cars. And when I talk about height, it's just probably this mashup of the crossover genes and the car genes. And it's not just about height either, of course. It's about the sort of appendages, the, the sort of bullish ways in which they, they assert themselves with the wheel arch treatment and so forth. So, And this, of course, is, is centered to that as well. I mean, this is, I, I suggest, just about a crossover, but you could say, well, it's, it's kind of a car. 
Um, I'm actually just sort of pulling back a bit and looking at it through a Toyota lens. It's got a lot of RAV4 in it. And of mm. course, that's a successful product, been there for some time. In the latest iteration, a lot of the aesthetic or the themes of this seem to come from that nicely, I think. And in actual fact, it looked really well resolved on this in the way that perhaps they were not on the RAV4, benefiting of time, of course. And then it's also got a bit of that spice of the sort of GR almost that, that, that Toyota have. This sort of um, aesthetic that's more sporty and more expressive. So the sort of mashup of different Toyota ingredients it's got, I think, is really strong. Not a huge fan of the name. I, I don't think it's very helpful when these car brands give themselves lots of uh, letters that and numbers and just throw them together. But um, I think the exterior is really interesting and, and, and well resolved. And whilst it is quite a lot happening there, it, it all hangs. It's all really, really consistent. And then, as you say, jump into the interior, a lot happening there, even at the top of the steering wheel is missing. Um, which maybe is this a slight hat off to what Toyota did with the i? Sorry, what um, Persia did with the i cockpit? I mean, they stuck to their guns with these tiny steering wheels with a slightly flat top and bottom, and then the instrumentation sitting above them. Not everybody was going there, but they stayed with it, which is somehow really impressive. And actual fact, I think that this and maybe the the, the Tesla are acknowledging some of the the value in taking that sort of approach by just losing the top of the steering wheel. Ultimately, how it works on the road, well, we'll have to give it a go. I, I still fail to understand why the top bit of the steering wheel is not useful to steer the car with. But um, I don't think that's the, the core story here, um, Eric. I think it's no. mostly about the overall product um, yeah. and, and the aesthetic that it brings, which is which looks to be really strong. Looks to be really strong. I, I agree that it is a good-looking vehicle, um, certainly from the A-pillar rearward. I would, I would argue even that it's, you know, from a Toyota perspective, even though they are, you know, used to, um, or, you know, have traditionally always been quite busy. Um, I think it, it works well, as you say, you know, there's a lot of Toyota elements within that, that uh, there's, there's, uh, some harmony or some synergy rather. And, um, and, and it's interesting that, you know, the front face is, is just a bit more butch, I suppose, than um, I would expect it to have on a vehicle like that. Um, and that's just, you know, me kind of, you know, thinking out loud right now. <laughs> For me, the, it's the, the, the fact that it is a new brand, right? That is, it's a sub-brand now that they're calling BZ, um, and it's going to be sitting underneath the Toyota, and it's going to be all battery electrified thing. Now, one, I don't understand why you would need that, seeing as we're all going electric at some point or other. So what's the point of having a BC nomenclature? Um, it's it's like, you know, BZ, okay, beyond zero, sure. Um, but why even, you know, just just call it, don't, don't call it a sub-brand, right? Which I believe they are. Now, the other thing is, if you are in fact creating a sub-brand, why don't you go all in and create something that is a bit different, that is, you know, more standoff. And for this to be the first product, as I mentioned, it is certainly going to be a sales success because of the vehicle typology that it is and because of where it sits in the market um, in terms of size, in terms of, um, you know, uh, typology, and certainly in terms of features, because, you know, there's a lot of cool things in this um, from a technology perspective, as well as a general user experience perspective it's certainly on the interior right you've got this big screen in the middle and you've got these cool fabrics and running around so it gives you that kind of good feeling um and then of course you've got this this yoke steering and, and a bunch of like tech so i don't doubt that it's going to be a successful product um you know it does have a lot of really interesting uh elements to it certainly like i said from a technology perspective and it is all very toyota so why not? Um, you know, it's an interesting product for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not wholly sure about the, the thinking behind the, the sub-brand, Eric. Um, but I think um, if we were going to be throwing stones at branding, then it might not be necessary to go to the top of the list. I think there's quite a few brands from China, um, which seem to be just uh, on the constant churn, which, which in my head make no sense. But yeah, it is a, I think it is an intriguing product and laudable. And it is named, of course, the concept. It is a, the BZ4X concept. So this mm. is a preview design. Oh, is it? We, we can okay. both see. We can both see it's essentially a production design, um, yeah. and I, maybe we just lose some of the color or the material details. I'm not sure. Maybe the yolk. I don't know. I don't know the details of that. Perhaps the yolk stays. But um, yeah, it, I think that's one of the more impressive. And and just sort of hold up again. It's another one of these vehicles that sits as not a sort of pure car. It, it's sort of not pure crossover. It's not pure car. And, and just in this conversation we're having now, we're increasingly talking about new products 
which are near pure, neither pure crossover nor pure car. They're in this new band that sits between them where you could kind of almost call them one or the other. Um, and I do think it's it's quite marked how that's coming through. But interesting I, I, designs, all of them. I, I agree. I, I, I want to say everybody's going electric. Uh, it's interesting to see how different manufacturers are approaching this. Some are going super hardcore on the aero um, in order to maximize you know, the efficiency of the, of, and extend the range of the vehicle. Others are still really sticking to the practical aspects of what it means to own a vehicle, electric or not. What do you have a car for? What do you need it for? And how does it play into your life? And that's what I think Toyota is answering um, more than others, perhaps. <laughs> Right. So, Sam, thank you so much for taking the time yeah, well, um, good, to speak with me. To yeah, good to do these, Eric. Um, hopefully people will hear us and think that we're getting better, not worse. Or, um, so, yeah, it's um, always fun to do this. And, and of course, we've just talked about, what, uh, seven products which have come from very quickly anyway, in the last two, three weeks. Um, and, uh, and as we speak now, we both know there's like almost as many again to talk about uh, any second now. So, yeah, really interesting time for car design. It's amazing. I mean, you know, Shanghai uh, is just a ridiculous show. There's so much product. It's really, really difficult to wrap your head around that in person, let alone from a distance. So, yeah. um, but anyway, we will revisit that in the uh, in the future. Maybe talk about some Chinese centric product. Maybe not. We'll see. But thanks again for joining me, and to all our listeners, uh, wherever you may be. Thank you very much for joining us again. And um, until next time. <laughs>